Hello, it's Scott Manley here. And tomorrow, Monday morning, if all goes well, we will see the very first launch of the Vulcan rocket. I'm going to say it is a complete coincidence I'm wearing this t-shirt. Like, I actually wore it yesterday, slept in it, and this is me first thing in the morning without my makeup. But yes, this shirt uh, comes from somebody I know that happens to work on the BE-4 engine. But yes, uh, Vulcan rocket is a hugely important step for the United Launch Alliance, the company that has been launching Atlas and Delta for the last 20 years or so. Uh, ULA has a, a very interesting history. Uh, they started, so ULA was basically formed as a shotgun wedding between the uh, launch divisions of Boeing with the Delta II and the Delta IV and the Lockheed, which had the Atlas V, and they were forced together to make sure that the US had access to space. You see, in the early 2000s, there wasn't really a commercial launch market in the US was viable. Both those launchers, all the launchers were just too expensive. Like NASA had the shuttle, it was doing its own thing. But for actual satellites, those were launching on expendable rockets. And the commercial satellites, they were all going overseas. They were going to Europe with Ariane Space or Russia with uh, you know, launching on uh, Soyuz or Proton. Some even went to China. The US launch providers, they were just fighting over what the US government was delivering. And the competition got kind of nasty to the point of like, well, dubious activity and lawsuits, right? The, at one point, Boeing was found to have thousands of pages of internal trade secret documentation from Lockheed. And uh, a lawsuit ensued. There was a very real chance that a judge might decide that Boeing was not allowed to compete for US government launches. And that would leave the US government with only one working launch vehicle. So they kind of forced these parent companies to split off their launch divisions, merge them into one entity known as the United Launch Alliance. And it would operate all these rockets. And by having a diversity of rockets in a single company, it would assure access to space. And they also threw in like a billion dollars per year to make sure that the company could at least stay afloat and stay somewhat competitive. Now, obviously since then, we've seen the rise of SpaceX and a number of other launch companies and ULA has begun to adapt. And the sort of genesis of Vulcan started in 2014. There was a number of pressures. First of all, SpaceX was starting to try and get in on the government launch market. It actually initiated lawsuits to get a chance to get a crack at these contracts. But also around the same time, Russia's annexation of Crimea ended up uh, calling into question the supply of the uh, RD-180 engines, which were going to be the first, which are the first stage engines of the Atlas V. So one of the launch vehicles was potentially losing its engines. The Delta IV was well understood to be very expensive and only really interesting in its very largest forms. And so ULA really set out to uh, build its own rocket. And around about this time, they also brought on the CEO, Tori Bruno, who has had a great effect on the company and has pretty much been hands-on, as I understand it, with a lot of technical decisions and critical decisions in the development of Vulcan. In terms of size, the lowest end is comparable to like a small Atlas V. The largest version is better than the Delta IV Heavy. So in technical terms, Vulcan is a two-stage rocket with the first stage being fueled by methane and liquid oxygen. The second stage is, is an evolved version of Centaur, which uses hydrogen and uh, liquid oxygen. And also to provide diversity and payload capabilities, it can be equipped with up to six strap-on solid rocket motors. Now, it was designed to use similar facilities to the Atlas. And since it's so much bigger, and since the fuel it's using, methane versus uh, kerosene, is lower density, that means the stage has to be fatter. Vulcan is about 5.4 meters in diameter. That's bigger even than the five meter wide Delta IV, or, well, Atlas was 3.8 meters, and Falcon 9 is even skinnier than that. And the reason that uh, ULA can ship such a fat booster is that they literally roll the rockets onto a barge on a river and sail it around, whereas Falcon 9 was always designed to be transported on roads. So overall, the rocket stands about 62 meters tall. That's about 200 feet. The first stage is about 33 meters tall, and a lot of the structures are made from these uh, machined orthogrid panels. What you do is you take a thick sheet of aluminium 
and then you machine in a structure that provides uh, rigidity and re resists bending. You bend this into correct shape and then um, weld these into barrel sections and then stack them and then you have a rocket. It is a very mass efficient way of building these structures as opposed to say having very thin material and then welding you know, stringers and ribs onto the interior like SpaceX does. So the first stage is propelled by two BE-4 engines developed by Blue Origin. They're actually going to use seven of these engines on the new Glenn rocket, but Vulcan only needs the two. These are you know, high technology methane liquid oxygen engines that use a staged combustion cycle, which is much more efficient than the gas generator cycle that is used on the Falcon 9. However, they're not quite as ambitious as the Raptor engines, which are using higher chamber pressures and of course a full flow staged combustion cycle. All the same, they are quite up to this task. Now, early on in the Vulcan development, Airjet Rocketdyne wanted it to use the AR-1 engine, which they had been developing. This was much closer to the RD-180 engines that the Atlas V had used. They were still using uh, RP-1 and liquid oxygen and using these staged cycles. But ultimately, Airjet, it looked like it was going to be more expensive and take longer to develop. The first stage can also accommodate up to three pairs of uh, GEM 63XL solid rocket motors. That's graphite epoxy motors, right? Uh, these are you know, 53 tons and 200 tons of thrust. And yes, there's no equivalent of the Atlas V using a single solid rocket motor, so we're not gonna see power sliding off the pad. But the, what we will see is a capability of launching an awful lot of mass to geostationary orbit. And those high energy geostationary capabilities come from the Centaur 5 or Centaur V. It's the same diameter as the booster and it uses two RL-10C engines with a propellant mass of 55 tons. This is an upgraded version of the Centaur 3 using basically pressure stabilized stainless steel tanks and you know, for comparison, the Centaur 3, which is used on the Atlas V, has only 21 tonnes of propellant. So initially, there was actually the plan that the Vulcan would launch with the Centaur 3 for its first launches and then evolve to a larger Centaur 5 and then potentially to something called ACES. That's the Advanced Cryogenic Evolved Stage. And this was a big plan that ULA was pushing around for a long, you know, a, a, um, an upper stage which had much more endurance, something that can stay in orbit for a long period of time and perhaps act as a space tug. So ACES, one of its uh, signature features was something called integrated vehicle fluids, where it would use the hydrogen and oxygen on board to replace a lot of capabilities that would be supplied by other parts. For example, they would use autogenous pressurization, so they no longer would have needed helium bottles for tank pressurization. They would then use the hydrogen and oxygen for their uh, reaction control thrusters and eliminate, you know, things like hydrazine or cold gas. And it would have an internal combustion on board, which would burn hydrogen and oxygen. And the power from that would be used to pressurize hydraulics or uh, generate electricity. So the spacecraft could operate in space for a long time and potentially either act as a space tug or refuel other spacecraft. And this Kind of put it in the sights of uh, Richard Shelby, you know, senator from Alabama that was a big proponent of uh, space, uh, you know, SLS. And um, yeah, that was probably one reason why it wouldn't end up getting funding because it was you know, potentially competing. It was uh, potentially removing missions from SLS. And so that would never fly. Of course, now SLS depends on in-space cryogenic refueling. And Richard's short-sightedness is one of the reasons why we are going to be behind schedule for HLS, but hey, that's just politics. But anyway, yes, uh, the Centaur 5 was a, is a big deal. It's really, because it's a high performance hydrogen upper stage, it can uh, send stuff to geostationary orbit uh, with much more efficiency than equivalent rockets. So there's also a plan for an upgraded version, which will use uh, RL-10CX engines, which have much longer nozzles. That will improve the engine efficiency. It only adds about one and a half percent of specific impulse, but that small difference increases the mass they can get to geostationary orbit, you know, direct from six and a half tons to seven tons. And this will be offered down the line. So in terms of straight up performance numbers, the smallest Vulcan without any strap on boosters will deliver about ten and a half tons to low Earth orbit and three and a half tons to geostationary transfer orbit. And Apparently, if they launch without boosters, this will also mean that they 
uh, actually underfuel the core stage so that it launches off the pad with su uh, sufficient thrust to weight ratio. Now, if they then strap on six boosters, the capabilities rise to about 27 tons to low Earth orbit, 15.3 tons to geostationary transfer orbit, and seven tons direct to geostationary Earth orbit with those uh, upgraded RL-10 engines. So Vulcan is launching from Slick 41 tomorrow. It, that's the same pad that is used by Atlas V, and indeed it was designed to have a lot of commonality with, in terms of pad infrastructure. That's why the rocket is kind of fat, because it has to be short enough to fit into the you know Atlas V in, uh, vertical integration facility and use the uh, the pad in the same way. There is actually a separate mobile launch platform that's used. You know, there's a mobile launch platform for Vulcan which is very different to the one which is used for Atlas V because Atlas V is so much skinnier. But the ground service equipment, you know, it had to gain a new capabilities. It had to carry, obviously, the methane for the new uh, core and it had to carry a lot more hydrogen for that upper stage. Um, so, yeah, that was a lot of, you know, small number of changes, but otherwise they are really using the existing infrastructure. So now any post-Falcon 9 world, we can't talk about a new rocket without talking about the potential for reusability. And as it comes out of the gate, it isn't reusability, but that doesn't mean that they never considered it. And they have actually come up with a concept for reusing some of the Vulcan rocket. It's called Smart Reuse. And Smart is an acronym which I forget, but the whole crux of this is that they want to reuse just the engine section with the expensive engines, pumps, avionics, you know, on its own and throw away the big tank. Now there's good reasons for this. First of all, they only have two big engines and you can't throttle one of those engines down low enough to make a vertical landing possible. Furthermore, this is designed to use up all the propellant in the first stage and not leave any behind. That means this first stage is moving a lot faster when it you know stages and the second stage goes off and does its thing. The structure probably would not survive entry at these velocities. So instead, yeah, they want to just recover the engine section. It will use a, an inflatable heat shield. It will deploy a parachute. And initially the plan was that there would be a helicopter which would catch it in the air and then bring it home. But after they tested lofted, the, you know, low, um, the, the inflatable heat shield system, they have decided that if they do smart, it's going to land on the water and use this inflatable heat shield to keep it above the water and keep it uh, secure from salt water and the rigors and dangers of the sea. There will be a, a water recovery and then they will, of course, go on and you know fly again in theory. And so, yes, speaking about flying, well, the first mission is going to be primarily carrying Astrobotics Peregrine Lander, which will go and land on the moon, hopefully. Uh, it will carry some other payloads. There'll be a uh, Celestis is going to carry a memorial payload for uh, which basically has human remains, you know, cremains on board that will be carrying them off to the stars. Um, but you know, beyond that, there's a lot of other missions that are already booked. The second mission is supposed to be Dream Chaser, which will carry cargo to the International Space Station and hopefully bring stuff back from the International Space Station and direct to an airport for a quick offloading. Well, airport, runway. <laughs> Wouldn't it be great to have Dream Chaser land at SFO? I would love to see that. Um, yeah, beyond that, they're going to start launching uh, national security missions. To uh, The first one will be to geostationary orbit. The next one will be a GPS payload to medium Earth orbit. Overall, there's something like six Dream Chaser missions that have been paid for. Uh, 20 national security missions, you know, Department of Defense, and 38 missions for Amazon with their Kuiper payloads. So ULA does actually have plenty of work for Vulcan. So now it is launching in 2024, which is, well, five years after the original 2019 date. But, you know, there's been technical problems early on. They took a while to settle on the engine design. There were changes from the US government requirement for launch vehicles that pushed them back and then there were delays in the BE4 engines completing their certification and delivery right down to the where's my engines Jeff meme uh, and then last year while they were testing a Centaur upper stage there was a fiery failure when the structure gave out gas leaked and the test facility erupted into flame at Marshall Space Flight Center they had to go and re-engineer the Centaur stage get it recertified and it was ready to launch 
Well, we were expecting it to launch on Christmas Eve. That never happened because of another minor on-pad delay. Now we expect it to launch tomorrow. If not, it's got another you know, two weeks before the next window, but I'm hoping that it finally gets away. And that will be a huge deal for a United Launch Alliance. It will be the first new rocket. And it will really finally sort of begin to separate them from their parents who haven't really been the best parents, right? It's been known that Boeing, again, would put pressure on ULA to cancel certain projects because its donors or lobbyists were not happy with it competing. Lockheed, similarly, would... Uh, put pressure to cancel things like lunar landing hardware that ULA was interested in developing. And uh, yeah, ULA is known to be up for sale. It's courting buyers. There's three big, strong leaders, apparently, uh, Blue Origin, Textron, and Cerberus. I'm not sure what will happen, but I expect that if Vulcan is successful tomorrow, we will suddenly hear a lot more from potential buyers because it will certainly uh, increase the value of ULA in the public perception. Also, by the way, that beautiful red paint job, uh, I really love it. I, I, I was in the factory and I saw it and I was like, damn, that is a pretty rocket. Apparently, that's for this first launch and there's no guarantees that we're going to be seeing it on subsequent launches and really it will largely come down to whether the customers want to pay to have a nice fancy logo on the side and honestly, I would really like to see that. Wouldn't it be cool to have more fire or shark teeth or stuff on the side of rockets? I miss those days. Well, tomorrow, Vulcan, I'll be watching. Best of luck. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.